Hey everybody, welcome to Meet Firebase, where you get to meet the Googlers that make Firebase happen. On the show with me today is Alex Skiboff. Alex? Hey. Great having you on the show. Good Thanks for being be here. here. Now, would you like to tell me, what do you do with the Firebase team? I'm a tech writer and I work on Firebase app indexing, real-time database, and the iOS SDKs. Okay, great. So if the people at home have used the iOS SDK, they've probably encountered some of your work at some point. Absolutely. So tell me, where are you from? I'm from San Diego originally, and then uh, moved up here for school, and then moved back to San Diego, and then back up here. Okay, so you've bounced around California a bit, Love but you're it. a California native. So Indeed. <laughs> you're the first California native we've had on the show, even though we are filming here in Mountain View. So you are a native speaker of Spanish. Now this, of sí, course, señor. makes you at least bilingual. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Hablo español y anche parlo italiano. Okay, so you're trilingual. Yeah, I learned Italian in college and studied abroad in Florence, and I've since forgotten a lot of Italian, but I still can get by. But English is not your first language, nope. though. Nope. My parents were both from Mexico, so they were also Spanish speakers, and they wanted me to learn Spanish at an early age. So they spoke to me in Spanish, and then they had me watch a lot of Sesame Street and Mr. Rogers. Um, and the Snorks. <laughs> <laughs> I like that show. <laughs> yeah, that's a good show, right? Um, and uh, Mr. Rogers is responsible for my cardigans. Um, and, uh, and then my dad was a really big believer in, in sort of learning grammar and, and making sure that you had a solid foundation in language. Uh, so he gave me grammar lessons in both Spanish and English. And uh, I was able to read and write in both languages by the time I hit kindergarten. Oh, that's fascinating. Yeah. So that probably had a lot to do with uh, leading up into your career as a, as a tech writer, yeah. having that very strong background <laughs> Writing in drills at an early age. <laughs> yeah. And then you ended up uh, majoring in English Lit, but that's not what you originally wanted to do. What happened there? I actually went to school thinking that I was going to major in biochem, and then uh, Stanford has a really great management science and engineering major that looked really cool. Um, and then I just really wanted to take English classes and maybe go to law school. So I started taking more and more English lit classes and uh, loved writing and loved it. And so I stuck with it. Okay. So you crossed streams into, into yeah. literature eventually. <laughs> you also didn't expect to get into tech. So how did that happen? When I graduated from, from college, I, I really thought that like I would pursue a writing or an editing or a publishing career, uh, do that for a couple of years and then go to law school. But I sort of learned HTML, CSS, and JavaScript and started applying that on the job at, at the newspaper where I worked. And once the newspaper started kind of going progressively more downhill and layoffs were on the horizon, um, I started applying to more and more writing jobs and uh, took a tech writing job at ESET, which kind of married the skills of, of writing, which I had a, a strong background in, and uh, my interest in tech and my love for all things tech, and I just loved it. Oh, that's interesting. So you're it, formally yeah. trained as a writer, but then yeah. you had enough tech experience that you were able to sort of merge the two. Yeah. So like most uh, writers, I assume you like to read. Um, mm -hmm. I like to read. I, I read mostly nonfiction and uh, like news and, and tech articles and stuff like that. So what kind of stuff do you like to read? I like to read a lot of science fiction and fantasy novels. So huge Harry Potter fan, um, and then Patrick Rothfuss, and his King Killer Chronicle is, is one of my favorites. Uh, Name of the Wind and Wise Man's Fear are great books. Okay, okay. So you're a tech writer, you read fantasy. <laughs> yeah. That makes you, pushes you into the nerdy, geeky side of things, bit, which yeah. is, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm there as well myself. And so Nate also likes to read. He seems to read the same book a lot, so, you know, that's his choice. So I'd also like to point out on the issue of being kind of nerdy and geeky, you were married on Super Pi Day. Indeed. Now, I know what that is. I don't know if everyone at home knows what that is. Could you explain what that is, Super Pi Day? Sure thing. So uh, Pi is 3.14. Four one five nine two six five three, uh, and then et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It goes on forever. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, 2015, March 14th was Super Pi Day because it was 3.14.15, and my husband and I got married at 9.26 in the morning, and we like to say it was 9.26.53, and we got it exactly on the dot, which is totally true. So March 14th, <laughs> 2015, 3, 14... 15. 15. Yeah. And then the time also matched yeah. up. I had to get up very early in the morning. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm sure it was worth it, right? <laughs> totally. So how did that go? 
The wedding was very carefully planned. We got married at Castle Rock on top of a boulder, and then we went wine tasting afterwards, ate a lot of pie. Everything was kind of like last detail was planned. And then when we went on our honeymoon, the best laid plans really did kind of fall <laughs> apart on that one. We were supposed to go from Oktoberfest in Munich to Venice via overnight train, and we had booked this like sleeper compartment. Oh, fancy. Um, and it looked, yeah, it looked super fancy. The pamphlet made it look amazing and our tickets and everything was all set. And we got an email kind of at 8 p.m. and our train was supposed to leave at 11 saying that our stop was canceled, which was kind of mysterious and not very informative at all. Yeah. So we went to the train station and asked at information, you know, our stop is canceled. What does that mean? And the gentleman at the information station was like, well, you have to go pick it up in Salzburg and you have um, four minutes to get to platform 10 and that's where the train leaves from. So go. So going to hightail it. Yeah. <laughs> so we ran across the train station, got on the train, and then it turned out that all of the borders were actually closed in Germany because it was during the refugee crisis and that's why our stop was canceled. So we ended up hopping on this train to the border of Germany and Austria, then go via bus across the border and then wait until 2 a.m. when the train actually left from, from Salzburg in Austria. And the whole time that we're on this train, we have really no idea what's going on. The conductor of the, the train in Austria is like, this is an Austrian train and these are German tickets, you know, like you stupid American. <laughs> and we're just like, and then it turned out our sleeper compartment didn't actually come over because of the borders being closed. So we just had to kind of find a random place to sleep and, but we, we made it to made Venice it and, yeah. and it worked and you know, it's kind of first world problems, right? Yeah, you make all the plans and yeah. not everything works out the way that you want. <laughs> but uh, as a tech writer, you still, you still have to make plans and yes. you probably have some sort of a process involved to plan for Firebase documentation. So could you tell me a little bit about what you do to plan for that? Yeah, typically when we have a new feature that's launching or an update that's launching for a product, um, when you go to write documentation for it, you look at, at what the actual user journey is going to be like. So if I'm a developer and I'm working with this product or working with this feature, what is my process going through it? And then kind of documenting so that and thinking perspective. about that. Yeah. So trying to imagine what the user will be trying to do or accomplish, what their goal is. So. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, so, and then you start to think about like other developers and like how they would approach it and, and you try to cover it from all angles and put together a doc plan, an outline of the process, an outline of the steps. Um, and then as you're actually documenting it, use the feature, use the tool. Um, a lot of times tech writers are the ones who kind of spot really big user experience errors because you're, you're going through it and you're just like, this really doesn't work. You know, <laughs> this actually is kind of broken in the product. And so you can mm. funnel that back, which is really satisfying. And then most of the time it, it works really great. And, uh, and then you get to document it. Oh, that's great. Yeah. yeah. So I, I noticed that um, we get a lot of good feedback about our documentation. And so <laughs> it's good to know uh, who's yeah. contributing to that. Um, now, one thing that's interesting about technical writing that you told me earlier is that um, you're not allowed to use slang words, right? Because that's mm -hmm. not appropriate. Um, like maybe you would in more or less formal writing or, you know, uh, uh, sort of creative writing. You can kind of play flat, fast and loose with English. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but in technical writing, you can't really do that. So one of the things you told me earlier about tech writing is that you're not really supposed to use uh, slang in your writing. Um, so like uh, for creative writing, you might play very fast and loose with the English language, but you can't really do that for technical documentation because it just doesn't make sense. You'll lose readers, right? Um, so, but the fact of the matter is English speakers around the world and even within the United States use different words for the same thing. Yeah. It's just a matter of fact, right? It's not that it's slang, it's just that they, they just use different words. So I was wondering if you would play a little game with me to explore that a little bit. Sure. Um, I'm gonna ask you some questions and I'll ask for your opinion, what you would say, not that it's right or wrong, but um, we'll compare that with, to uh, what other people in the United States might say. So let's do the first one. How do you address a group of two or more people? I would say you guys because I'm from California. Because you're from California? Or just because it sounds natural. <laughs> yeah. So you'd say you guys. Other people might just say you. Or in the South, it's y'all. Or as you said, it's also just you guys. Yeah. So, and I think that is what most of the U.S. would say is you, mm -hmm. you guys. So you're very, very sort of on the norm for uh, <laughs> American speaking. All right, let's do the next one. What do you call it when several roads meet in a circle and you drive around in that circle? 
A roundabout. It's a roundabout? Okay. So you chose roundabout. That's very common in the West. So right here in California, that's mm -hmm. in the West. Uh, in the East, it's called a traffic circle. And in the far Northeast, it's a rotary. So I'd never really heard that word until yeah. I, I lived in the Northeast it's a little like a bit. like a phone. Yeah, I was like rotary dial phone, <laughs> yeah. exactly, yeah. All right, let's do the next one. What do you call a long sandwich that has cold cuts, lettuce, and other toppings on a bun? A sub. A sub, okay. Yeah. So that's what most of the US would say, it's a sub. However, in Pennsylvania and Philadelphia in particular, it's called a hoagie, also a hero. Some people will use the words grinder or torpedo. Sandwich. Wow. Yeah, so I had heard most of those living yeah. in Ohio. Uh, that's where <laughs> I grew up. Uh, but yeah, sub is, is what most people would say. All right, let's do the next one. What apparatus, sometimes attached to a wall, do you use to get a drink of water? A drinking fountain? A drinking fountain, okay. Drinking fountain is, again, what most people would say in the west of the United States. Okay. So you're on the norm for the west. <laughs> in the east and the south, it's a water fountain. That's what I grew up uh, saying, mostly. Um, but the really interesting thing is, in Wisconsin and Rhode Island, uh, it's called a bubbler. That's Did amazing. You, had you heard that before? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. I had a friend from Wisconsin and she told me that and I was genuinely shocked. Yeah. That's like, oh, that's a thing. Okay, interesting. All right, next one. What is the most general term for shoes you might wear for athletics? Sneakers. Sneakers, okay. So you deviated from the norm for, for people in the West. So tennis shoes is most common in the West of the United States. Sneakers is a very New England thing. Interesting. Uh, that's what a lot of people would say where I lived in Boston for a while. And other parts of the world, you just might say gym shoes. So, yeah. all right, let's do another one. What is the road with multiple lanes where traffic moves quickly? Freeway. Freeway, okay. So that's a very Western yeah. <laughs> thing. In the East, it's highway. And some people would go further and say that a uh, freeway and a highway are two different things. Freeway's wider than a highway. Okay, another one. What are you referring to when you say the city? <laughs> New York. New York. Oh, that's what you mean, really? Okay, because most people around here in the say Bay Area would say San Francisco. Yeah. yeah, but most of the United States refers to New York yeah. as the city. But my um, husband's from Jersey, and that's a huge pet peeve of his. <laughs> really? <laughs> that's interesting. Yeah, so if you... bliss, I just... <laughs> Say New York. Yeah, just, okay, you can change the way you think about it, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> so people who live near Boston would also say Boston, and Chicago also has a following. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's interesting that you adopted a different way of saying it. Looks like you speak very much like a West Coaster, with a few exceptions, of course. <laughs> so thanks for playing. And thanks Thank for being you. on the show. It was great having you. Thank you for having me. And if you want to read more of Alex's work on the Firebase documentation, be sure to do that by clicking the link below. And if you want to subscribe to more video content like this, do that by clicking the subscribe button right here on the Firebase channel on YouTube. Thanks for watching Meet Firebase. I'll see you next time. Bye.